All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, before our regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting, uh, we have our American Civics Curriculum hearing. So I'll call to order the Papillion La Vista Community Schools Board of Education American Civics hearing, uh, curriculum hearing. We will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. Thank you all. A roll call, please. Here. 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 Present. Here. Here. Thank you. Again, for those of you watching at home or those in attendance tonight, uh, as always, we have our open meetings law posted at the entrance to the boardroom. All right, that concludes section one of our American Civics Curriculum Hearing. Moving on to section two, the American Civics Curriculum Hearing itself. I will turn it over to Ms. Siri for our presentation. Perfect. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Education. Uh, Lucas is going to pull up a document here. Uh, this is part of our annual review. Um, you can see that according to state statute 79-724 um, is a law that um, addresses all of the American civics curriculum. Uh, what you have in front of you here, we're going to scroll through it. On the left-hand side is the actual law, and on the right-hand side is the district's response to it. Uh, this is a document that we put into place when the law passed in 2019. Um, and uh, tonight, I'll give you an update of where we currently are as social studies is in our current um, curriculum evaluation cycle. So you see here um, up on the screen that the left-hand side just stated that all school districts must have an American Civics Committee. Uh, we already had an existing one in our district, so that was not a change for us. Oh, my mouse is a little slow. Okay. Okay. It says that the board must hold two public meetings a year, one that will take public testimony. That is what's happening here tonight. We have that scheduled for January or February. The next part of the law um, simply states that um, the social studies standards, or excuse me, the social studies curriculum will be based on um, the Nebraska social studies standards. As a board of education, you adopted um, the social studies current standards in 2020. We are currently in the process of aligning our curriculum to those, and the Nebraska Department of Education updated those in 2019. The next part um, goes into detail with the, the wording of the law, and it simply states that the curriculum then must be um, built and established based on those pieces. And um, you can see there that, uh, as I noted earlier, Currently, our social studies curriculum is in for evaluation and updating, and we will bring the final um, curriculum adoption for approval to the board in the spring of 2023. If we continue on, um, the next part of the law states that the curriculum must be available to the public, and of course ours is. We have a section dedicated to it on our webpage. Um, currently, that is our existing curriculum. Once it is, um, the new one is adopted uh, by the Board of Education, we will replace that. The next part simply states that an instructional model um, must be tied to the curriculum. This is with all of our curricular areas. Um, in our district, we do use the Marzano instructional model, and we do have classroom assessments tied to the curriculum um, as formative and both summative. Uh, those will be updated to match the new standards as part of this development process that we are in. Our current curriculum process takes um, four years total. The last year, um, it really takes three years to do the work, and the last year uh, the curriculum is piloted and um, tweaks and adjustments are made as necessary. The next part simply says that to ensure the social studies curriculum, it must incorporate one of the following events for the students. This is currently in our high school government class, and what our district chose was the third bullet you see there on the left. 
Um, our students are um, required to participate in a school board meeting or a public meeting. It could be a city council meeting. Um, but any public meeting, and we do offer different ways for them to do that, and they are required to write a paper based on that as part of their civic involvement. The next part simply states about that all of your social studies courses um, must include those particular pieces as stated in the law. Ours currently do. And then the next section, section three, um, four, and five are specific to different grade levels. Um, the first one is the elementary, and it ties to um, American history must be included, uh, including patriotic songs. We do have that, and there's a link there that's tied uh, to the patriotic song list that we also use in our district and our elementaries. And it continues on with grades three and four. And you can see that it also must include the state constitution and um, state civics. And our fourth grade is earmarked for Nebraska um, history and civics specifically. The last part is tied to the high school. It simply says that the Declaration of Independence and local government and the constitution must be included in the curriculum, which it is. And then the last part um, goes into the specific parts of government, which is in our current 11th and 12th grade government curriculum. The last part of this document is very specific to Americanisms. It mentions on the left-hand side of what holidays will be recognized according to the law, and then um, which components of um, those days are tied directly to the social studies curriculum. And then section seven is specific um, to say that the district goal must meet and the board must approve the curriculum, which we do as part of our process. So the last part that I'm gonna share with you tonight is kind of where we are currently at in the adoption and evaluation of our current social studies curriculum. So the last school year, we have been working um, mainly in the summer and then this school year with our social studies teachers to unpack and align to the current social studies standards that you adopted in 2020. Um, that work is being identified right now with specific learning targets to make sure that we are in compliance with the law. Um, they have just recently started, our toolbox process is just beginning to evaluate resource materials that will match those learning targets and standards. Um, we have a tool that we use to evaluate and review those, that checks for things such as bias, and also to make sure that there's good alignment with our current um, standards as well as the new curriculum. Um, our goal is to have those narrowed down by summer and um, the curriculum department then at that time will offer a public viewing of those materials. So we will make them available to our public, our community um, for a week's time here at the central office and we'll make that um, known through communication and um, our community members can come in and look at the materials that we are looking at to adopt to match the curriculum piece. Um, as far as the actual adoption of the coursework, um, the, the courses have pretty much stayed consistent. I think the biggest change is coming at the high school level. Um, last year, the Nebraska State Legislature passed a law stating that personal finance needed to be a required course for graduation as part of the social studies curriculum. Uh, we did have that course already in place. It was tied to our business curriculum, uh, but the standards now are part of the new social studies standards. Um, so the social studies teachers are working on that. They've taken that existing curriculum and they're updating it and it will be rolled out um, on a broader scale, meaning more sections of it will be taught. It's currently being taught, but we'll offer more sections as we um, get all of our students through that as part of that graduation requirement. And that brings me to the end of the update. Um, once those materials are put out for public review, we will do a, we'll continue moving forward with a pilot um, of the final products to make sure that they do match and they align and they're matching the learning targets that have been outlined and they adhere to the state standards. And then from that point in the spring, we'll come back to you with the full curriculum for your approval. And that is the update of the American Civics Curriculum. Questions? from the board before public comment. Okay. 
All right, thank you, Ms. Siri. Moving on to item B, under section two is public comments specific to the American Civics Curriculum hearing. Uh, seeing none, uh, we'll move to section three, adjournment. Uh, I'll adjourn the American Civics Curriculum hearing for February 14th, 2022 at 6, 10 p.m. All right, moving over now to our regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting. I'll call to order the Papillion La Vista Community Schools Board of Education meeting for February 14th, 2022. Uh, as we've, uh, under section one, as we've already uh, completed the Pledge of Allegiance and roll call, uh, again, we'll move right into section two communications this evening. Uh, first up this evening, Got a couple of monarchs here to give us a student council update from Papillion La Vista High School. I'll welcome up Macy and Sam. Good evening. Welcome, Macy. Welcome, Sam. So I'm Macy Waldron. and this is Sam Lockhart. We're just going to give an update about what's going on at PLHS. Um, first off, with athletics, a girls swimming and diving team took third at Metro Championships and were very successful. Our event winners include Olivia Dettinger in the 200 IM, Elizabeth Ford in the 50 free, and Olivia Elizabeth Grace Cunningham and Leah Erbacher in the 200 free relay. That same group set a new school record in the 400 freestyle relay. Gracie, Olivia, Teresa, and Elizabeth set a new school record in the 200 medley relay as well. Um, our boys were also successful in swimming and diving. They took fifth at Metro's and Landon Orth won diving for the second year in a row. Moving on to wrestling, um, our boys wrestling finished second at districts on Saturday. Congrats to them. 10 individuals qualified for state, which begins this Thursday at the CHI Center in Omaha. And two of our girl wrestlers as well qualified for state, and they start on Friday. The bowling season ended last week with two individuals that qualified and participated in the state tournament in Lincoln. Um, our boys and girls basketball teams end the regular season this week with games on Friday and Saturday, and then we'll be moving on to districts. Uh, spring sports officially starts two weeks from today, and athletes and coaches are working very hard with preseason workouts and conditioning. So we're kind of transitioning from those winter sports into the spring ones. So now, yeah, Sam will talk about activities. Hi, Hi I'm Sam. Uh, for activities, the show choir competition season ended this past Saturday. Our three teams have competed the last five weekends, and Free Spirit, our varsity team, has won two championships. State cheer and dance is this week in Grand Island at the Heartland Events Center. Our cheer, cheer team competes Thursday, and our dance team competes Saturday. The annual Color of Hope game was this past Friday night versus Gretna. This was the 14th annual event, and we raised over $6,000 for the American Cancer Society. And a huge thank you to Ms. Matheson and the junior class officers for holding this event. Uh, DECA students are preparing for a state competition in Lincoln, which will take place in March. Uh, HOSA is preparing for a blood drive hosted at POHS on March 3rd. Our band staff and students are preparing for their annual dinner and auction night, which is scheduled for Sunday, March 5th at POHS. Student council is planning and preparing our winter formal dance, which will take place Saturday. February 26 at POHS. Our powerlifting team finishes their season next weekend at Midland University in Fremont. Our spring musical SpongeBob is coming up on March 31st with opening night. And finally, we have moved into the new freshman wing, STEM classrooms, and office area. That's all we have. Thank you. Thanks, Macy and Sam. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions for Sam or Macy? Thank you. Thanks, for, thanks for the update. As always, you're, you're more than welcome to stay, but uh, I have a feeling you probably have quite a bit to do. So you're also welcome to uh, get on with your studies this evening. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Thank you. All right, moving on to item B this evening. Uh, we have a couple of recognitions uh, this evening, and I will turn that over to Dr. Rickley. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Lotus, members of the board. So for our audience members who are with us this evening, as well as those that may be watching on YouTube, one of the things we like to do at least once a month is provide recognition for students or staff that have done something exemplary to distinguish themselves for the school district. Uh, this evening, we have one staff member who's here this evening, and we have one student who I believe is also here uh, this evening. Uh, the staff member that we are recognizing this evening is the recipient of the 2022 NSIAAA Assistant Athletic Director of the Year. The Nebraska State Interscholastic Athletic Administration Association selects a winner out of peer nominations who demonstrates exemplary performance and dedication to the youth of their community and the state of Nebraska. Who we are talking about is our own Bubba Penas, who is Dean of Students, Papillion La Vista South. On behalf of the district and community, can we give Mr. Penas a round of applause and invite him to approach the boardroom table? Well done, Bubba. And our second recipient uh, this, this evening, and I'm looking at Ms. Iman now, I believe the second recipient is with us this evening. Uh, we have the 2022 State Bowling Girls Singles Champion, and she actually has a couple of uh, really outstanding things we're recognizing this evening. The first is a perfect game. Now, I'm not much of a bowler, ladies and gentlemen, but I do know that a 300 is exceptionally rare at any level. This individual rolled the first 300 in Nebraska varsity competition that occurred against Omaha Marion in January just last month. This individual went on to the state competition where she was averaging 205. She rolled a 232 and a 217 in her two championship games. That was enough to bring home the state title. Of course, we are talking about our own Claire Bush, who is at Papillion La Vista South High School and a senior. Claire, we're incredibly proud of your accomplishments. Please come on down and be recognized by your Board of Education. Outstanding individual. Well done, Claire. And with that, Mr. Lotus, I'd conclude our recognitions for the evening. Thank you, Dr. Rickley. And again, congratulations to you both. Well, well deserved honors. Uh, that concludes item B. Moving on to item C under section two communications. Uh, our public comment this evening on items not on tonight's agenda. Uh, again, those of you that may be new in the audience or watching on YouTube, uh, public comment period. Uh, shall not exceed 30 minutes unless a majority of vote of the board approves to extending the allocated time. Individuals are allocated three minutes uh, individually, and we just ask that as you approach, your name is called, we approach the uh, microphone and state your name and address for the record. All right, first up this evening for public comment on items not on tonight's agenda is uh, Ms. Brittany Holmeyer. And I'll, I'll remind, sorry, Bri. Um, again, Ms. Branco will have uh, her, time, her timer. Um, it goes off about two minutes and 15 seconds for the first beep, uh, and then uh, we'll go off again at that three minute time limit. So sorry, I just wanted to oh, get great. that out there for anybody that's new, so no surprises. So welcome. Not, not new here. <laughs> okay, anyways, Brittany Holtmeyer, 2007 Ridgewood Drive. Um, so I was just gonna talk about my email again with Mrs. Siri that I have been exchanging about a month ago now. Um, slowly exchanging. My email had stated that I had a question regarding the mental health support that is stated on the Papillion website under COVID. 
it states bullet points and then one says continuation of social and emotional learning curriculum. Can you please provide an example of how SEL is being taught in the mental health regarding COVID? To me, it was not confusing as it came straight from the website. Her response was, Brittany, good evening. I'm not sure I understand your question, so please let me know if this does not address what you want to know. The SEL curriculum is taught at the elementary and, school and middle school levels. I cannot give you an example because COVID is not in the curriculum. So then I had stated the same email and sent it back with a screenshot in my email from your site. Um, she had responded back and also CC'd Annette Iman, which I did think was odd. It said, Brittany, the COVID section on our website that you referenced is designed to explain to parents in the community the protocols and the proactive measures Papillion has put into place due to response to COVID. One of the many areas we have been concerned about during this global pandemic is the mental health of our students and staff. SEL is listed on the website as one of the action steps we have put into place to support students' mental health. The SEL curriculum began in our district in 2018. The SEL curriculum is taught by a classroom teacher. There are no specific topics in the SEL curriculum regarding COVID. The SEL curriculum was put into place to support students' mental health, which is why it's listed on the website as one of the many steps we are doing to support students' mental health. I hope this helps. So with that email, um, you're using ESSER funds, which is COVID relief money, to fund the SEL program, when the program had already been in place since 2018, as they had stated. Um, if there is no example of COVID, then why are you using money for it, and why does it say it under the website COVID? To me, it seems like a misuse of funds. Social emotional learning. So schools asking young children as young as four in preschools to explain their emotions and actions is just insanity. The teachers are not professional psychologists or therapists. They should be teaching our students math, science, social studies. So I'm still waiting to hear back on how this is being used in the schools. Are the teachers coaching? Are they saying you're doing the right thing to their students? You're protecting others. I, as a mom, can only think the worst because I have had no response on how it's being used. And Rickley has stated back in the spring that COVID and masks have no mental health on children. So why is this in place? And I'm not sure if you have seen the viral video of the children in Nevada. They had joy, they yelled, they screamed in excitement, they smiled, they cried because they were allowed to take their masks off. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up this evening for public comment on items not on tonight's agenda, uh, Ms. Lowen Eby. Hello, my name is Lowen Eby. I reside at 1401 Edgewater Circle, Papillion, Nebraska, 68046. My comments are focused on policy 3203 and my audit of the financial statements from 2012 to 2021. Policy 3203, periodic financial report states, the superintendent and assistant superintendent for business services will prepare monthly financial reports to ensure that the board is fully familiar with fund balances and the district's financial condition. All school employees who handle funds will be bonded or covered by district insurance. As a result of my audit, I found the following discrepancies. My school buck fees, the total balance is is misreported in multiple statements, Exhibit A. The check disbursement reports have variances in the reported totals versus the actual totals for multiple reports, Exhibit B. The September 30th, 2015 agenda is missing the check disbursement report, Exhibit C. The financial statement for the June 24th, 2019 agenda should have May 2019 beginning and ending balances Instead, the statement has April 2019 beginning and ending balances, Exhibit D. The 5% gross in lieu distribution overpayment total of $946,054 is unaccounted for, Exhibit E. Nebraska Revised Statute 79-516, School Board, Power to Indemnify Liability Insurance Purchase, Subsection 5, 
Any indemnification under such subsections, unless ordered by a court, shall be made by the school district only as authorized in the specific case upon a determination that indemnification of the school board member or the officer, employee, or agent of the school district is proper in the circumstances because he or she has met the applicable standard of conduct set forth in such subsections. As information, I will be filing a complaint with the Nebraska Auditor of Public Accounts with copies to the Nebraska Attorney General, the Nebraska Department of Education Commis Commissioner, and ALICAP, Alley Cap, the insurance company, regarding my findings. The complaint with all supporting documentation will be available at papillionpatriots.org. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Thank you. Uh, next up this evening, uh, Lorene Renante. Good evening, Lorene Renante, 1108 Park Drive in Papillion. So I don't have any real formal information and I know that this is under the consent item so I really didn't know where to put this. But I'm having some emotions and feelings about this purchase of this house, this yellow house that sits behind us, wherever behind us is right now. And I'm concerned, one, it was a 280 some thousand dollar offer. I checked the comps. I guess for the age of the house, it's 110 years old. I guess those are good comparable sales. Um, but I'm, I'm not even worried, although I'm always about money, but I'm worried about, is it going to be torn down? It's a history. It's a 110-year-old house. You're going to put it up and tear it down and build a structure for technology? I mean, I don't know. Um, I understand anybody can sell their property. I'm a big, huge property rights advocate, but I just... I, I don't know, you're using my tax dollar to buy something that might be overvalued to get rid of something that's paying property tax. I, I, I don't know, I have more questions than anything, but I guess I want to have somebody care about the preservation of that house. So that's all I really have to say, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up for public comment this evening, uh, Ms. Megan Elkins. My name is Megan Elkins and I reside at 1212 Buckboard Boulevard in Papillion. And I just wanted to bring some information this evening um, on something that I found by Dr. Robert Malone. And it says, before your child is injected, know that a viral gene will be injected into your children's cells. This gene forces your child's body to make a toxic, sp toxic spike protein. These proteins can cause permanent damage in children's critical organs, including their brain and nervous system, their heart and blood vessels, including blood clots, their reproductive system, the vaccine can trigger fundamental changes in their immune system. The most alarming point about this that once these damages have occurred, they are irreparable. You can't fix the lesions within their brain. You cannot repair heart issue scarring. You can't repair a genetically reset immune system. This vaccine can cause reproductive damage that could, be, uh, that could affect future generations of your family. This novel technology has not been adequately tested. We need at least five years of testing research before we can really understand the risks. Harms and risks from new medicine often become revealed many years later. Ask yourself if you want your child to be a part of the most radical medical experiment in human history. One final point, the reason they're giving you the vaccine, giving you to vaccine, vaccinate your child is a lie. 
Your children represent no danger to their parents or grandparents. It actually is the opposite. Their immunity after getting COVID is critical to save your family, if not the world, from this diagnosis. There is no benefit for you, for your children or your family to be vaccinated, your children against a small risk of the virus. Given the, given the no health uh, risk to the vaccine that as a parent, you and your children may have to live with for the rest of their lives. I'd also like to say thank you very much for making masks optional. Again, my children are very happy to come to school and my daughter's migraines have cut down and I'm very happy for that. But um, I also just want to keep track if we're doing the vaccine clinics, I really would like to know if the schools have enough AEDs and stuff in place and in case something should happen because the risk of this vaccine on children having heart attacks is very scary. And I would want to make sure the school is prepared if something like that were to happen to one of the students. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes public comment for items not on tonight's agenda for this evening. Uh, moving on to item D under section two communications, uh, our superintendent's report. Dr. Rickley. Thank you very much, Mr. Lotus, members of the board. Uh, again, for those who are in attendance this evening, thank you for being here. We always appreciate the community showing up and participating in our board meetings and certainly for our community members who are watching on YouTube, we appreciate your engagement as well. Um, there was something I was gonna lead with, but I wanna go number two because we have a fussy baby that may need to uh, may need to be excused. Uh, so one of the things on my superintendent's report that I wanted to share with the board and community is that Dr. Settles and her team have been really busy uh, filling a number of administrative positions, mainly due to retirement, but also some of the dominoes that fall after somebody announces for retirement, and then we backfill their position with an internal per uh, person. Uh, two of the individuals I'd like to recognize that are here this evening. Uh, one is internal. Uh, Mr. Trent Lyons, who's seated in the front row, uh, thank you for joining us tonight, uh, Mr. Lyons. Trent's currently uh, the lead teacher at Liberty Middle School and has done an outstanding job for us uh, in that role at Liberty Middle School. Uh, because of an internal move, we had an assistant principal opening at Papillion Middle School. Uh, Mr. Joel Bales, who will be moving up to Monarch, uh, and Trent Lyons was uh, selected to serve alongside Mr. Tim Johnson, who's also in the front row. Thanks for being supportive of Trent and his family by being here tonight, Tim. But we are absolutely thrilled that Trent has accepted that position. We know you're gonna do wonderful things at Papillion Middle School. Uh, second of all, uh, a building that's very near and dear to my own heart, Bell Elementary. Uh, Ms. Mary Derby, who's our current principal, has announced her retirement for the upcoming school year. Uh, the Rickley kids have all gone through Bell. They're all Bell Bulldogs. Uh, we love all of our buildings, but uh, as I said, there is a special place in my heart for, for Bell for the outstanding work they've done with my own family. Mr. Brian Gaysink is here, uh, who will be our brand new chief Bulldog. Uh, Brian is currently an administrator with the Millard Public Schools and uh, the pool of candidates that Dr. Settles brought in that we talked to for Bell was just really outstanding. So for Brian to come in from the outside and be selected for one of our very largest elementary buildings says a lot about Brian and his character and his ability. Uh, and I believe we have a, a newest member of the Papillion La Vista Community Schools family seated to Brian's left there. So thank you for bringing your, your young family here tonight, Brian. Uh, if, if I may board, may we congratulate these two outstanding future leaders of Papillion La Vista Community Schools. So Trent and Brian, you're obviously welcome to stay. We'd love to have you, but we also know that sometimes duty calls with family. So do what you need to do, but thanks again for being here. Uh, so back to the initial uh, announcement, I wanted to thank this Board of Education and celebrate what they do every day. Uh, this is Board of Education Appreciation Week, which for our uh, members of the community, you can see Everything from uh, nothing bunt cakes to notes to student samples of artwork. This is our opportunity to say thank you to our six Board of Education members. I know I've said it multiple times in multiple ways, but it bears repeating again. You will find no better Board of Education anywhere in the metro, anywhere in the state, and for my money, anywhere in the country. 
this, this is an outstanding group of people that are in it for the right reasons. Um, this board is not paid. Uh, this is one of the few bodies of elected officials that receive no taxpayer dollars. In fact, quite the opposite. They're donating their time. They are burning personal vacation time for committee meetings, for board meetings, for professional development, for end-of-the-year activities. The list goes on. It's not a 40-hour-a-week position, but there are weeks where it's pretty darn close to that. And they're doing it not for the pay, but they're doing it because they love their community and they love our children. And for that and many other reasons, they are very, very worthy of our respect and admiration. I'd like to give them a round of applause. Well done. And in appreciation for that, I believe our uh, communications department has put together a brief video with some students and staff expressing that same level of gratitude. Ms. Iman. This one. Make it quite a big school so everybody can fit in it and um, teach us stuff that we actually need to know. To raise money and to if we can build a new playground or not. Make sure if the weather's good to go out. They like probably schedule our um, field trips. I, I'm guessing they donate money to the school for like music, PE, or in everything. They'll make you like read a lot and learn. They'll also play like some fun activities. Make rules so people stay safe and they, and they don't get hurt. Tell the kids that they do something wrong to write apologies. To help people learn and help people get better at, like, math and reading. We help the people who are in charge of the school, like, give them plans to what to teach. The whole building, it's theirs. They own the building. Probably what playground equipment we get out there. Pick really good foods for us to eat. Make sure it's safe. Like, the teachers are the teachers. They would maybe decide what's best for the schools. Um, and maybe what can help children learn, and maybe to like help build the schools and to direct the teachers, principals, and to help make sure the school is doing okay. A trampoline. A new playground. Ice cream every first Wednesday. Longer spring breaks. If we did good work, we could get um, different kind of prizes. Popcorn, a lot more popcorn. Maybe we get like, I don't know, ice cream or something sometimes for lunch. For everyone to have the same reason, and we could go down to the field and play together. Like an extra recess. To build like a volleyball court for our playground. Like more reading time because I like reading. I mean, it's. It's already usually fun the way it is. I can't think of nothing to ask because they really gave everything to me that I wanted. Thank you, Miss Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Thank you, Mr. Madler. Thank you, Dr. Tafoya. Thank you, Miss Witt. Thank you, Mr. Lotus. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Thank you, Mr. Madler. Thank you, Mr. Lotus. Thank you. Is he the one that owns a school? Thank you, Miss Fisher. Thank you, Dr. DeFoya. Thank you, Miss Wet. Thank you. That's the biggest word. Thank you. You are kind and you keep us all safe. It's honestly just perfect the way it is right now. amazing job. Thank you, Ms. Iman, and again, thank you to the board for what you do every day to support our community, our staff, and most of all, our children. Uh, speaking of good news, uh, we, we haven't had a COVID report in some time, and frankly, with the data trending the way it is, uh, we felt that there probably isn't a ton of reason unless uh, something changes significantly with what we're seeing at the district level or the two-county area. 
but our data is definitely moving in the direction that we had hoped. And frankly, it's doing exactly what our health departments and our epidemiologists said it would do, where COVID would burn hot, it would burn fast, but by early February, it would largely burn out. Cases are still higher than we would like to see, of course, at both the two county and the district level. But even compared to just a few weeks ago, it's remarkably less. Uh, two examples, uh, when you look at our surveillance report, for example, which tracks all illness, not just COVID, of course, but all illness, as recently as three and a half weeks ago, we had uh, approximately 1,300 students out. That's approaching 11% of our school district. And you could feel it walking through our hallways. Kids were gone at a pretty alarming rate. I think the last time I saw the surveillance report, we were at about 350, so we, which, which would be very typical for this time of year during normal flu season. Uh, so that would be one data point. And then second of all, the one that's probably most meaningful to parents and families is the 7% threshold that we set as our trigger for, for masks. Uh, as of last Friday, all 21 of our buildings are below, and in some cases significantly below, that 7% threshold. We had one building, Golden Hills, uh, that's kept the mask on through last Friday. Uh, part of that was the size of Golden Hills. It is our smallest elementary building, less than 300 students, so it only takes a handful of kids to get to that 7% threshold. But again, happily, all of our buildings are out, which means our central office is uh, mask optional as well. We said we would keep central office and masks as long as one school was in. So we're moving in the right direction there. Uh, moving on to some other things that Dr. Settles is working on, leadership cohort, which is something that this board is familiar with, the community may be familiar with, but uh, we recently revamped our in-house leadership development program, partnering with UNO to provide graduate credit, where we select a number of teachers who apply, it's a very competitive process, and they have expressed interest in leadership positions. In some cases, they want to be an assistant principal, a principal, uh, a director. And in some cases, they just want to explore different leadership opportunities that don't involve administrative positions. But we welcomed approximately 18 uh, new participants in the leadership cohort and really excited to see them grow and work with uh, our administrative team. Also had our student advisory, our teacher advisory, and our classified advisory. Again, as the board is aware, we meet with a number of groups periodically. The teachers we meet with four times a year. Classified staff we meet with four times a year. Students we meet with every month over lunch. And we talk about what's working, what's not, and how we can continue to improve as a district. Uh, we had some really good conversations about climate uh, and what's working and what's not and what's been challenging during the pandemic. And we've, we got some really insightful information from our advisories as always. Also wanted to remind uh, the board uh, and thank the board members for uh, going with me to Lincoln for the Legislative Issues Conference a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the legislative session is moving fast. We're beyond the halfway point. In fact, Mr. Richards and I meet every Monday morning with uh, Tim Gay for a briefing on what's happening. And in fact, I think we'll have Mr. Gay back in, if not the next meeting, then the following meeting to give the board kind of a mid-legislative uh, session update. And lastly, we'll end on a high note, the Community Closet uh, project that's obviously near and dear to all of our hearts. Uh, we recently held uh, a community uh, basically giveaway on February 12th, which was last Saturday, La Vista Middle School. Uh, asked Dr. Myers how many clothing items we gave out. She said, Andy, I can't give you a specific number, but it was thousands. Uh, coats, shoes, shirts, pants, uh, basic toiletry items, uh, some of our most vulnerable families. Uh, that are just checking their pride and saying, I need help, and we're here for them. So just want to thank uh, the board for their continued support with that. We're, we're making a difference. And with that, I'd conclude my superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Rickley. All right, moving on to item E under Section 2 Communications this evening. I'll open it up for uh, board comments. I just have a quick uh, thank you also to the students and staff for their uplifting treats and gratitudes. It really is uh, a treat to get to read all of the handwritten notes from our elementary kids and to receive these wonderful yummies that come along with them. So thank you, thank you so much. And Dr. Rickley, I agree, it's an emotional issue when we can help our community with the community closet. So good job on that and thank you for doing that. You kind of stole all mine, but yeah, it's fantastic. Love it. Brightens up the room. I think, Kathy, you and I were talking about that, like all of our uh, bouquets and everything else, but it's fantastic. Um, so excited to hear about the, the community closet. It's amazing. I know uh, my wife works at that building, and she talks about it, how, how amazing it is. Uh, you know, just a, a neat thing to have there. So um, really appreciate that. that. That just, to me, it, it definitely hits home. 
definitely it's home. So, uh, but thank you to, to all, everybody. I mean, for everything that's over here that says thank you for, of course, my waistline will not thank you after my bunt cake, and I think there's a cupcake. But other than that, and I think there's something down here too, candy, but um, do really appreciate it. Thank you all so much for uh, everything. One of my greatest joys is reading the notes that the students write. They're, the, some of them are really funny, some of them are so touching. And I remember when my children were in school and younger, I would come home from this evening and they would immediately say, Mom, what's in the bag? Is there stuff for us? Are there, is there candy? Are you going to give it to us? And very quickly it would go out to them. But um, I'm, I'm going to talk about something that's, well, not really our school district, but in a way it is. I'm so very, very, very excited over the new choice from the Millard superintendent, Dr. John Schwartz, who was ours for a while, and, and we, we missed him when he left, um, although we had a great person back filling his position here, but it's so exciting to see him um, having that opportunity to serve as Millard superintendent. So really looking forward to the continued wonderful relationship we have with that school district with our current superintendent moving forward as, as John takes that role. So that's, I was just really, really excited to see that as it came across. Of course, he is, uh, he's an asset and he was an asset to us and the Millards are going, Millard uh, school system is going to thrive under his leadership. Uh, I really did appreciate seeing that I appreciate great seeing all those the cars like everyone else has uh, said they uh, the children are have a very unique way of expressing their opinions and uh, I do get a I'll be reading tonight when I get home and I'll be laughing it a yeah, big it happens laugh too um, I do think that that one young lady thinking about having ice cream on Wednesdays if they invite the school board I think I would probably vote for that yeah, they, they hit me. That's one of my weaknesses. I can't walk away from an ice cream cone. But uh, thank you. I do appreciate that everybody's thanking us. Uh, it's kind of nice once in a while, but, you know, uh, lately it's been uh, rather uh, trying, to say the least. And it's nice that the children uh, appreciate what we've done for them. And I do know, I, as I go through the community, that the... Uh, the older, the adults have the same uh, feeling towards us. So uh, sometimes uh, we have a tendency when we only hear the negative that uh, we think that that's a, that's a true picture, but there are more people out there that value what we do. You mentioned that we do not get any pay. Well, this is pay. To see this, see those children express themselves to go to a basketball game and watch our, our students play, go to any of the other sports, see that young lady with the bowling. When I read that, uh, we had uh, the uh, show choir competition, and both the Monarchs and the Titans have done very well. You know, that, that you know, I, I have a small part of that, you know, very small part, but I'm still proud of the fact that I had a little bit to do with all that. The teachers have to be proud of uh, when they say the accomplishments of these students. Uh, no, we get paid. Money is not the only way we can. Uh, that's what seems to be the common denominator for pay. But there's other. Good thank you is, is probably worth a, how much? How many dollars? Million? I don't know. But a good thank you is awful nice. The cake's not bad huh the not bad. oh i got i got red a bit another weakness red velvet i got a, I, as i get older I come, i'm developing i've learned how to handle temptation i give into it before i say no my waistline but now no. now i just give in uh, for me, uh, regarding the, the COVID update i mean i want to thank the students and the staff i know you know it was a rough start back to this semester i don't think you know, when we uh, left in December, we were uh, thinking it would get that bad that quickly with almost, what, 11% out by that second week. So uh, I want to thank the staff for hanging in there and the students, too, and it's great to see that it's trending in a good direction and that all the buildings are, are back to uh, mask optional, so that is great. 
Um, and then, yeah, with everyone else, I want to say uh, thank you to the, the staff and the students that put all this uh, together. Um, I mean, I will enjoy going through it uh, as well um, because, I mean, I will read everyone. It, it is the, um, at times this can feel like a thankless job, but this really gets you uh, back being motivated and reinvigorated and, and making you uh, realize, oh, yeah, there are people out there that do, that do appreciate. Uh, even though I'm sure it was uh, not the students' ideas to, to write, thank you, school board, uh, that is all right. I will still accept their, their <laughs> notes and their appreciation. So thanks. No, great. I I can't, I can't say any, anything else that everybody else didn't say. Um, I just wanted to kind of highlight a couple uh, positive uh, things that, that are going on in the district. And I, and I just, uh, you know, going back to, to my years and, and the, the different clubs and associations and the things that our students bring forth to their sponsors or the ideas they have to be creative, to uh, go after their passions and, and take a little venture into philanthropy. Uh, again, uh, as our as Sam uh, noted, that, you know, last Friday the the Color of Hope fundraiser uh, at the Monarch basketball game. I mean, six thousand dollars, fourteenth year that they've done this. It's it's so well supported by our community uh, and 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 the students and the staff that that sponsor that. Um, so that's just again, it's just phenomenal what what the folks in this district and the supporters of this district do uh, to support our students, but also support others in the community. Uh, and then um, also on Friday night, uh, Papillion South uh, hosted Elkhorn South. And uh, in between the uh, women's and men's game, uh, they had a, a unified game uh, between uh, the Papillion uh, South unified students and Elkhorn South unified students. Uh, and, and what's just phenomenal is, you know, we were one of the first, well, I think we had the first two, first two. Uh, between Titans and Monarchs. And now to see unified sports uh, expanding into other districts and to, and to see uh, the students supporting uh, their fellow students uh, and, and, and giving those kids the opportunity uh, to engage and, and, and participate in, in those events uh, is just pretty phenomenal. So again, big credit to the, to the unified sponsors. Uh, I know we have a, a new hire, I believe, that uh, is coming in next year that has an idea for another unified sport. Uh, so to, to hear about, uh, again, people thinking about further ways to expand that program uh, is just phenomenal. So, again, thank, thanks to all for that. Um, and just, again, some other positive things that are, that are going on and around the district. Any other board comments this evening? I would like to mention, you know, uh, in that a uh, number of us went down to uh, Lincoln to uh, hear the senators and see what they had to say and talk to us about the various bills. Uh, there are a number of bills that are going to, if they are successful and pass them, they are going to affect not only this board but the whole district and the citizens of our community. We definitely have to uh, uh, stay alert and make sure we can do everything we can to prevent some of those bills uh, that are, they're dangerous to us. Uh, they're coming into our boardroom and telling us how, how we have to, uh, what laws. We've already have so many um, rules that we must follow from Washington. By the time we make the uh, people in Washington happy, the time we make the people in Lincoln happy, we don't have a lot of wiggle room, as you well know. There are a lot of things that we have no choice in. We have to do them. If these laws go through, we're even going to have less. We're not going to be, uh, we're not going to have the privilege of deciding what's going to happen in our district. And uh, there's about five of them, 1077, I think, is really the biggest one. I see last week that we did have one defeated. And I was very, very ready to do an Irish jig down 84th Street when I saw that. But I didn't, because I don't know how to do one of those things. But anyway, we have, we remain, we have to remain alert. And I'm glad that uh, um, Tim Gay it will be come visiting us and talking to us about those.
All right, seeing no further board comments, we'll move on to item F under section two communications, our committee reports, uh, building grounds and finance. We did meet and uh, we will be discussing uh, uh, item C, D, and E later on this evening about some of the conversations we had. Thank you, Dr. Tafoya. Human resources and student services. We did have a meeting last week. We had lots of items on our agenda, but nothing that will be on tonight's agenda. We Those will all be appearing on a future agenda. And as always, I welcome anyone who's looking for a good place to work to come apply for PLCS. Thank you, Ms. Witt. And curriculum and Americanism. We met this evening prior to the board meeting, um, and one of our items that we were talking about was already discussed as we did the uh, social studies hearing this evening. Um, we uh, had some discussion about the strategic plan update. We're getting back together uh, very soon here for some more conversation about that. And we had some discussion about the mental health liaison um, as it applies to uh, funds that we're using out of the ESSER 3. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. All right, that concludes section two communications. Uh, moving on to section three action items. Item A, our action by consent. Make a motion to approve the action by consent as presented. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Fisher and a second by Dr. Tafoya. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 All right, moving on to item B, the board meeting minutes of January 24th, 2022. I'll make a motion to approve the uh, board meeting minutes of uh, January 4th, 2022 as presented. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Bailey and a second by Mr. Madler. Roll call, please. Mr. Madler? Yes. 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 All right. Uh, the next few items, we'll be turning it over to uh, Mr. Richards here. So for uh, item C, the purchase of a district type A passenger bus. Mr. Richards. Thank you, Mr. Lotus. Um, this is an item that was on the uh, January 24th agenda for discussion. And I was able to follow up on a few things from that meeting uh, that was brought up by the board and with our staff. Um, you know, another reason they really wanted to go with the Collins model uh, was not only for the maintenance and the service part of it, but the training. So if they had, all the buses are have the same controls and the training part piece as well, which I left out last time. Um, and Scott Billings, who's our purchasing coordinator, also said that a lot of a lot of the things that have lead time right now end up being longer than the companies are telling us. Um, so he's not too caught up on the 180 days versus the 270 on the two vans. Um, one could come in sooner. Uh, he said we have some people that have told us we're 90 days out that have been, you know, 200 days out. So uh, that was just an example there as well. So not too much concern on his end on the lead time uh, between the two. So if I can answer any more questions regarding the purchase of this vehicle for special education, uh, needs within the district, I will do so. Appreciate your following up on those things that we had discussed last yeah. time, so thank you. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the purchase of a Type A 14 passenger Collins model bus for $71,625 from Masters Transportation. Second. All right, I have a motion by Mr. Madler and a second by Mr. Bailey. Any final comments, questions for Mr. Richards regarding the purchase? Okay, seeing none and seeing no public comment regarding uh, this item, uh, I'll move to a roll call, please. Dr. Yes. Mr. Fisher. Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Thank you. All right, moving on to item D, the new property purchase. Yes, uh, thank you again, Mr. Lewis. Um, 
Ken and Mary Peterson, who uh, live behind the district office here, has adjacent property, uh, approached the district uh, back in the fall, um, wanted us to have an oppor first opportunity to buy their property. Uh, Mary, being a former teacher in the district, uh, really feels strongly that she'd like to see the property uh, move over to the district hands. So we've had numerous conversations and walkthroughs and those types of things since. Um, it is zoned commercial, which is kind of nice within a residential area back there already. Uh, the house was appraised, so we did get an independent appraisal that we hired uh, to go out and make the comps and, and do the independent appraisal, which is required by law, uh, before purchasing a property uh, as a school district. Um, the price came back at 278000 They were agreeable to that price. Um, and the closing costs are minimal. I think I have those at $1,588.62 that the district will take care of as part of the closing. Um, we will try to initiate that closing here this week uh, with the Petersons. And it is a, and the public understands that to protect the public interest, we do try to do a lot of these negotiations, uh, whether it be a closed session, which we did on January 24th, uh, to protect the public interest and in trying to attain the pop obtain the property um, since you know there's probably some people that would be interested in that property as well and uh, we were able to have first shot at it um, so we're excited to have the opportunity to have that property it's a strategic acquisition uh, for the district for the future um, temporarily we'll more than likely use that for district storage and uh, community closet and that type of thing uh, for the district as we proceed and, and use it for future needs but Trying to acquire that property adjacent to the district office is pretty important in a growing district like ours. Uh, they probably will see five to seven more thousand kids by the time it's done, for, uh, filled in our boundaries uh, within the district. So uh, definitely more space, space will be needed for programming. Any questions regarding the purchase of that property? I was kind of surprised that it was already zoned commercial, and I think we talked about that a little bit. Um, I, I do think this is a good purchase for the district. It is adjacent to other property that we own, and you know, there, there's we've had a lot of discussion about what that property could be used for. Obviously, as it stands right now, there are depending on what we would want to use it for, we might have to do some improvements to the to the building as is because it doesn't have some of the things that are required to if we were having certain activities going on there but i do like the idea that we've had some conversation about using it for community closet um and, and some you know some of it obviously for storage and things so i do think that um, down the road there may be further conversations but right now uh, keeping the property as it is and using it to the best of the ability to solve some of our space uh, challenges that we've talked about with community closet is a great way for us to start the use of that property so i'm very supportive of this purchase in case uh, our community is wondering, since we have made a couple of references to Community Closet, it's currently based out of Carriage Hill Elementary, uh, but because of a early childhood classroom, which is going scheduled to go in to the very space where the Community Closet is located currently, we will have uh, we will have to find a new home for the Community Closet effective uh, next fall. So that's why there's a bit of urgency uh, and why this property probably makes sense in the short term as well as long term. And Mr. Richards, for long term for the property, uh, can you talk through what conversations you had with uh, the Petersons? Uh, what is you know potentially down the road uh, something happening to their property and how they would feel about it? Yeah, for sure. And that that was a big thing on our end. And they've lived there for a long, long time and taking care of it. And knowing that they reached out to us, uh, they they did say that they would have no problem with it being raised in the future uh, for the district needs. Um, as a matter of fact, I think they. Um, would prefer it probably than having somebody else live in the property that they lived in for so long. Um, and so that was one thing that was brought to our attention. If they, if they were had concerns about that, uh, you know, that would have been a consideration for us buying it uh, for sure as the property owner. Well, I may be wrong, but if I'm under the impression that when you have a building that you want to have a, a historical uh, a tag attached to it, you can move the building one time only. And so if somebody's interested in having that preserved, what, 10 years from now or 15 years, whenever we make a decision, uh, they can lift it, take it down the road and put it in. We have it over here at the 
the uh, portal school is a good example of that. A yeah, good point. And uh, so it can be preserved if that's what we choose to do. Yep. No, I think, uh, again, I, I strongly support uh, this purchase. I mean, they're, we're landlocked uh, around here. Uh, and, and the fact that they approached us, uh, and, and Mary being uh, a, a, f a former teacher, um, has a lot of passion for this district, uh, and, and they have a lot of faith in, in the district and the administration to make sure that they uh, take care of that property uh, and use it for uh, what's needed in the district in the future. Um, I agree with everybody else. I think, you know, short term, you know, using it, minimal cost to you know, renovate or do anything to house the community closet or other other needs there uh, does because we do need to find a new home for community closet. The overflow of community closet is also in an elementary building that is uh, one of the fastest growing buildings uh, in the district and they will be moving on from mostly one section uh, per grade to uh, two or three uh, very shortly and so that, that space is going to need to to free up as well. So um, again trying to honor their wishes but also um, appreciate the due diligence uh, and, and making sure that we are following all, all rules and protocols and laws uh, and making sure that we are doing our fiduciary responsibility and making sure that, that the, the uh, asking price uh, was one align, in line with the, the appraisal but also uh, within uh, the funds we have available uh, for, for such strategic purchases as needed. So appreciate the due diligence. Any other comments, questions regarding the uh, property purchase? I'll uh, make the motion to approve the Peterson property resolution and the purchase agreement for 438 South Adams Street, Pavilion, Nebraska, 68046 for $278,000 plus closing costs as presented. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Madler and a second by Dr. Tafoya. Seeing no further board comments and no public comment regarding this, I will ask for a roll call, please. Yes. 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 Thank you. All right, moving on to item E under section three action items. Turn it again back over to Mr. Richards for the uh, discussion on the RFP for elementary school cameras. Thank you, Mr. Lotus. Um, we did have a prior dis meeting discussion date of January 24th on this particular item. Um, I'll review a few things associated with that item, and uh, Mr. Bingham is also up here for any questions that the board may have uh, regarding the technical aspects, for sure, of the, <laughs> the camera system uh, that we're, we're looking to acquire. Um, so this would install cameras at all 16 elementary schools uh, in our district, along with our uh, preschool um, area. Rationale, I mean, we're looking at uh, improved access control and monitoring of who is coming in and out of the buildings. It's crime and pre uh, vandalism prevention. Um, student staff, staff safety are the biggest things that we're trying to get out here. Um, this discourages negative student behavior, including bullying in high traffic areas, cafeterias, and playgrounds. Uh, and it also assists with contact tracing if needed. You know, we're not at a uh, point in the pandemic where that's being required by the health department um, at this point in the pandemic. So. Uh, emergency preparedness, uh, real-time data and emergency situation allows for collaboration with law enforcement uh, should the school be in an emergency situation. So that's a big one there. Um, the RFP uh, is included in your packet. It de details the specifications on the systems. Um, this would be, if the board approves that tonight, go out in a public notice and uh, be solicited with certain qualified companies as well. Um, so we hope to get a lot of bids on this particular uh, project. The timeline is, uh, of course, we're recommending board approval tonight. Uh, we'd get that posting out um, as early as this week. And the RFP would be due back by March 9th. And then we'd hope to bring this back to the board with a low, um, low bidder on March 14th at the, that board meeting. And that RFP would call for these cameras to be installed uh, by December 31st of 2022 at all our buildings. And with that, I would take any questions along with Mr. Bingham. 
So if I'm understanding this correctly, we're going to do all the schools um, through the one project, and I'm assuming that's so that we have a similar system in all our buildings so that it's easily um, monitored, easy to understand how it works, those kinds of things, because to me this sounds like a really um, great way to do the project where it's not piecemeal, but we're getting it all done at one time. Correct, and I, I'd turn it over to you to comment on that, Lucas. Yeah, that's a great question, Ms. Fisher. Um, that's mainly the reason, uh, and and the other reason is we're tying the system to make sure it aligns with the system that was installed at our secondary buildings, so the entire district will be under one system, which uh, in the past hasn't necessarily been the case. Uh, I know in the past the high schools have kind of had different systems, so that'll really help uh, with access and training and, and a lot of these um, priorities um, and rationale pieces that Mr. Richards just went over. I've written a few bids in my time. This is a nice bid. Well done. <laughs> it's a team effort. There was a lot of folks that helped us put this together. So. Oh, he's humble. He, he's he coordinated that. He did really well. <laughs> uh, Lucas, question on the, you know, moving forward with it. I mean, there's a lot of camera. There's a lot of technology going in. Uh, a lot of cameras, a lot of technology going into these schools. What sort of ongoing resources will it take to, from like you and team to you know, maintain uh, the actual hardware or the, you know, maintaining yeah. the footage and, and yeah. uh, when requests come in to potentially review it? It's a good question. So um, we try to make sure that, we do make sure that someone at the building has access. So your typical day-to-day, -day, um, I would say, footage uh, retrieval review type of things we will empower our administrators at the building level to do. They certainly are always welcome to reach out to us if they need additional help, assistance, um, and we're happy to do that. Uh, the, it, it'll be a big project to lift off this summer and definitely one of our priorities this summer. The good thing about a system like this is once it's installed, um, all the components, you know, each individual camera can be replaced if needed to. So it's not, you know, Ms. Fisher brings up a great point that it's, it does make a lot of sense to do this all at once. We definitely talked about, you know, is it all going to go bad at the same time as well? And that'll be a consideration we'll have to make down the road. But the good news is it's not like we have to forklift the whole thing. Um, at any one point in time, we can replace components as necessary on a, on a long-term replacement maintenance schedule. So um, we've used the contractor that uh, uh, um, won the bids for the secondary projects for all five of those buildings. So they've done most of the field work, I would say, the, the, the nitty-gritty in terms of climbing in the ceiling and running the cable and actually installing the cameras, and then we take care of the back-end pieces. So I don't want to say it's not going to be uh, additional work for our team, but um, we, I, I, th I think we'll be able to manage it. It'd be fine. So, we got some good folks on our team to help with that. No, I, I know that this uh, has been a priority um, for uh, Mr. Lewis. I uh, brought uh, up this this idea uh, a few years ago now, uh, and again, just the timing and funding and uh, other priority of needs. Um, but I think it's it's definitely. Uh, I'm glad we're we're evaluating it now. Uh, it's long overdue. It's 2022. Uh, you know, we've got buildings with only front entrance cameras uh, with the, the secure, and that and that's it. And that's that's not enough. Most people have more cameras in their house, you know, than than we have in some of these buildings. And uh, it's you know up to us uh, as as uh, a board to ensure that we are. Continuing on one of our priorities, which is safety, uh, for for our students and our staff, uh, and this is just another step and another tool uh, to ensure uh, further protocols. So, definitely uh, looking forward to hopefully the bid process, uh, and we get some good competition to keep costs uh, in alignment. I'll make a motion to approve a request for a proposal to be advertised and bid on the on for the purchase and installation of a camera security system at all the district elementary schools as presented. Second. All right, I have a motion by Ms. Fisher. I had a tie, but I'll, I'll, <laughs> I think my left ear caught a little bit more. Sorry, Dr. T, but a second by uh, Mr. Bailey. Seeing no further board comments and no public comment regarding the RFP for elementary school cameras. Uh, roll call, please. Yes. 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 
All right, moving on to our final action item this evening, evening item F, uh, the policy 1000 uh, public relations and communications. Welcome, Ms. Iman. Thank you. Um, I went through these policies and procedural recommended changes in detail at the last meeting, but I would be glad to answer any questions that anybody has. I just had a quick question on the practice of approving the distribution of for-profit coupons or incentives. I know when there are some things like the E-rate program, you have to be careful when you're contracting with someone for federal funds or other funds that they are not influencing your decision by giving gifts. Is there a way that you monitor for that to make sure that there's not some compliance issue? Yes, and I'm, I'm not totally sure. I'm going to turn to Lucas a little bit for the E-rate funding because I'm not super familiar with that. But we have very strict guidelines. Like we don't, we allow certain gifts during certain times um, for employee appreciation only. Um, so that would be the only distribution of gifts. The coupons, are you talking about to students or to staff? Uh, yes, either one. Which one are you on? I'm Shannon? looking at the current, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's just not numbered, but it's towards the end of the, it says current practice for approving the distribution and then the coupon offering something special for PLCS students, uh, free student, in nature. The student piece we only do for recognition. So we don't allow just blanket distribution of gifts. So for students, it's only for um, recognition of activities. So for example, um, a lot of schools do like a student of the month, and that's when they'll give one of those recognition things. So it's, it's designed to be just recognition. Well, and that should be worded in there. It says the blatant advertising via the distribution of coupons for promotional items for the primary purpose of promoting a for-profit business will be approved if the following is met. And I just want to make sure that we don't lose E-rate funds because a telecommunications company that you're contracting with has influenced, it would look like you're being influenced by giving a gift like that or advertising on, you know, things like that. So it's yeah, just- Yeah, and I, I will be honest, I'm not super familiar with the E-rate. Lucas, do you know? Uh, but I do know that the guidelines are written very strictly. In fact, we have a lot of businesses that want to just yeah. send out coupons. It, they want to distribute stuff, and it's, it's very strict with the distribution, particularly for students. Right. Um, even our business partners, it has to be for recognition of an activity. So they can give a stack of coupons um, to a building principal, or actually we don't even really do coupons. They have to be free items for, um, but they can only be distributed for recognition types of activities, like the student of a month type of thing. Sometimes um, principals will do it with a, a birthday gift. You know, a lot of principals do a pencil and they'll do something, some type of an incentive with that as well. And, and my only example is for E-rate is because I know that. And yeah, I know that. Yeah, absolutely. But, and you're um, probably way more familiar with E-rate yeah. than I am. But, <laughs> but that has to do with influencing staff. If they get something, like to take them out to lunch would be considering influencing them to make a decision. But you, if you even just said something like, um, does not, it must comply with federal and state gifting rules. Just a sentence like that, that would cover that, I think. Yeah, as a consideration. The e -rate? I, I'll be honest, I haven't looked at this, but um, for specifically for E-Rate, none of our vendors that um, we deal with in the E-Rate program are involved in this piece at all, and I certainly watch that as we put out those bids and get them back. Um, but if, you know, certainly we wanted to add something in there to help with that. I think this part is actual, actually procedures, procedure, so, we so could, you could we approve could the policy changes okay. and we yeah. can add in, we can clarify that and add that in, Sue Ann. That's a great catch. Yep. And quite honestly, we've never been asked that before. <laughs> Other questions? Thanks, Lucas. No, no Other questions? When those coupons come in, do you approve the distribution? Does it go through a central clearing? Yes. Okay. So yes. You, you would and handle that and know if it was yes. compliant? And, and we're very strict on that. And I will say our secretaries are absolutely amazing. Um, a lot of times um, different vendors will want to just take stuff directly to the schools, and the secretaries are sending them to us right away. Um, so, yeah, I feel very confident that we have those protocols in place. Um, and, and we follow them to this T, and that's why we have this procedure written out. Thank you. Mm 
Any other comments or questions regarding either the policy changes or procedural changes, including the one that Ms. Uh, Witt suggest, just, just suggested? So that's in procedure. So I'm going to go ahead and make the motion to accept the proposed changes to Policy 1000 Public Relations and Communications as presented. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Witt and a second by Ms. Fisher. Seeing no further board comments regarding this matter and seeing no public comments regarding this matter, I'll move for a roll call, please. Yes. Mr. Wright? Yes. Mr. Yes. Dr. Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Simon. All right, that concludes Section 3 action items. Moving on to Section 4 discussion and information items for this evening. We will start with item A, our staff technology purses. Welcome, Mr. Bingham. Good evening. Um, it's hard to believe, but we have, it's, we're, we're over, almost approaching the four-year mark since the district um, uh, took on a technology audit of our landscape of technology. One of the items in that process that we identified was putting our staff devices on, just altering the cycle a little bit for our staff devices. We're um, following most of what was um, in place as a structure already, but with a few uh, minor changes. And so we are actually up for replacement for staff laptop devices for the buildings listed here in the summary sheet um, that you have in front of you for discussion this evening. Uh, the uh, cycle is a four-year cycle for staff uh, portable devices. And the technology plan is a five-year plan, so we'll look to refresh that or affirm it in 2023. And then it all lines up with a 10-year budget that we've put together that we're working off of um, to anticipate those expenditures. Um, one unique thing, opportunity that we have right now is uh, Mr. Lewis and, and Mr. Richards has continued this, uh, was very uh, supportive in setting up some depreciation mechanisms to help us support this process. So the thought is we have two pieces behind this. Uh, we have the depreciation fund to help us support the continual uh, investment in making sure we have quality, good working machines for our staff. Um, and the other strategy under this is using the residual value. So as we retire devices, um, uh, one of the district's practices uh, previously was to sell them to staff. We, we do no longer do that. We sell them back to a, um, uh, through a, a bid process, essentially. It's we take whoever can give us the most residual value for those, that money goes back into depreciation to help us support and sustain these purchases. Um, this time around, however, we have a unique opportunity with a couple of federal funding sources you see listed there. Um, one of them is through the Federal Communications Commission, so it's not the E-rate program, but it's under the same umbrella of, of those who administer and manage the E-rate program. Um, and then the other one is uh, under the ESSER II funds. Um, we anticipate that um, those two funding sources this time around will actually make this almost close to a budget neutral purchase. Uh, but obviously want to bring it in front of the board for discussion and approval as uh, it is a reimbursement process. So the district will expend those dollars out of our depreciation fund and then get reimbursed for them um, with these two funding sources that we've been approved for. Um, bringing it to you now with the hopes we can get the machines ordered and here in time uh, to deploy to staff at, by the end of the school year. We've talked with our principals and asked for their feedback. They really felt strongly that, that would be great to get them out to staff. Um, however, I say that a little tongue in cheek with uh, the caveat that we're obviously experiencing as we see in other areas potential delays in receiving goods and materials. So that's the goal. If something happens with receiving these devices, they do come directly from the manufacturer right now, which is uh, in mainland China. So they've got to come through, uh, they've got to be manufactured, um, shipped, go through customs, all of that uh, pieces there. Um, built on demand. There's not a stock of them sitting in the United States right now that could fulfill our order anyways. Um, so those are the, the kind of the highlights of this. Um, this is an approximately, we're st I'm still nailing down exact quantities, but it's about 350 machines for the staff members for those buildings listed. So be happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, we'll intend to come back at the February 28th board meeting for uh, final approval of this to move forward. Thank you for answering my question because I had written down how many, approximately how many yeah, devices. You're so thank you. <laughs> I figured that was going to be one. Yeah, and my mine was on the what what your th kind of thoughts were on the supply chain yeah. uh, and kind of timing of, of that 
knowing what the, the ports continue to look like and obviously with uh, um, really a couple weeks shut down for Chinese New Year, uh, yep. those manufacturers aren't, aren't producing. Uh, and we typically order a few uh, pilot machines, if you will. We ordered those actually directly from Apple beginning of January and we just got them today. Uh, so we ended up sourcing a couple of machines locally at the Apple store just to, to get our testing done that we need to get done so we can be confident with this model. It's a great machine. It's a great model that we're looking at, um, and so we we have pretty good confidence it'll be a great, great thing for our staff to continue to have access to. So, right now, I appreciate the uh, again the audit and the plan. Um, we all know how technology changes and the needs and and wants of our our staff and students, and so appreciate the plan. Yeah. I think the other question that might be in your mind is when does middle school and elementary come? So we did uh, middle school would be next year, 2023, and elementary would be 2024, and that follows the exact same timeline that we did uh, previously. So in case any of our friends are watching as well and want to know that. All right, any other board comments or questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to item B under section four discussion information items, the review of policy 2000 uh, board policies. Uh, Dr. Settles. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, in February, we have the series 2000s administration policies um, up for the annual review. So please go ahead and forward any changes that you would like to make uh, to myself and we can discuss those at the upcoming meeting. All right, thank you, Dr. Settles. That concludes section four, discussion information items. Moving on to section five, our future board calendar. Uh, uh, February 15th, 2022, tomorrow, the Collaborative Resilience Dinner at the Holland Center uh, for uh, the board, for board members that can attend, uh, and administrative members, I should say. Uh, again, February 15th, 2022, the NAS NASB Resources Workshop. Uh, February 21st, 2022, no school. It's a staff development day. And February 21st, 2022, uh, the next Board of Education meeting here at 6 p.m. at the central office, or sorry, the foundation, Papillion La Vista Schools Foundation Board meeting, I believe is here. Is that correct, uh, other board members? Yep. Yes. Here. I know we've, we've been virtual uh, for, for quite a while and then hosted uh, one at uh, Papillion La Vista High School uh, a little while ago. And then, uh, sorry, February 28th, 2022 is the next Board of Education meeting here at 6 p.m. at the central office. Seeing no further business before this board, I will adjourn the Papillion La Vista Community Schools Board of Education meeting for February 14th, 2022 at 7.28 p.m.